Okay, so we will be starting off today's show the same way we start off every Monday edition of the Zach Kroll Sports Podcast, and that is with my 10 main takeaways of the week. And without further ado, it's time to get to it. Unfortunately, don't have any music for you guys today. Technical difficulties, but those will be taken care of soon. So without further ado, let's do it. Takeaway number one, I think Greg Gard needed to coach a better game to close things out on Sunday against Michigan. And I totally understand that Michigan's comeback was great, and they deserve a lot of credit for that. And we're going to get into Jawan Howard and everything that he's done since he's gotten to Ann Arbor in a little bit. But man, this has to be a frustrating loss if you're a Wisconsin Badger fan. I was someone that actually predicted the Wisconsin Badgers to win the Big Ten before the season started. And it's not like they've been an all-and-out disaster. They've been pretty good. They've been okay. They're going to make the NCAA tournament. They're a top 25 team. But yesterday was a real opportunity to shift things in a different direction against Michigan. And it's so frustrating because in the first half, they were playing great. Demetri Trice is out here making shots. Micah Potter's playing well. But man, late in that game, Nate Reavers had no shot against Hunter Dickinson. Hunter was doing really whatever he wanted against them. And Wisconsin's mantra of playing uh, one of Reavers and Potter on the floor at all times, they never really liked to play two guys, uh, those two guys out there together. And maybe that cost them yesterday. I think Greg Gard needs to do a better job of getting his players up and ready to go. And he's done a good job since he's gotten to Madison, especially last year. But there are many times where his coaching will leave you scratching your head. Takeaway number two, I totally understand that the University of West Virginia Mountaineers lost on Saturday to Oklahoma, but I don't want to take that away from what they were able to do against the Texas Tech Red Raiders going on the road to Lubbock last week and getting the job done over Texas Tech. And West Virginia, what I like about them is one of their best players, or at least a guy who we thought was supposed to be one of their better players, Oscar Shibwe, he actually announced that he was going to be transferring in December, I believe it was. He since has committed to Kentucky, and Bob Huggins has had to do really whatever he could to change the style of way West Virginia plays. Now, they play the four-out, one-in set around Derek Culver, one of the best and most skilled big men in the country. And in this game against uh, Texas Tech, he really was able to take over. But shout-out to Oklahoma for then going into Morgantown and being able to beat West Virginia by themselves anyway. That Big 12 race is just getting better and better and better as the college basketball season goes on. And of all the conference tournaments, I totally understand that some people are going to look at the Big Ten and say, how is that not the best league in college basketball when they're going to be getting a million teams into the NCAA tournament? But I'll tell you this, right now, if you were to ask me Uh, Which conference is the best conference in college basketball? My answer for you would be the Big 12 because of the depth at the top especially. And one of the main reasons for that is Bob Huggins and everything that he's been able to do at West Virginia. Uh, They're playing at a really nice pace. They're making threes. I really like what I'm seeing from West Virginia. And if you ask me who is the team that could challenge Baylor in the Big 12, it may be them Unfortunately, West Virginia and Baylor have not played yet. They were supposed to play tonight, but it got canceled due to COVID. Takeaway number three. I'm not sure how many of you guys ended up watching that bracket reveal show that went on on Sunday, but I just have to say it's the most pointless thing ever. You know why? Because when you're watching college football, right? I'm not going to say that their weekly ratings really mean anything necessarily, but at the same time, what I will say is that at least the way they structure it and the way everything is being scheduled, it makes sense. If you look at it, the... um, the, they announced the top four teams on a Tuesday, and then everyone talks about it until Saturday, and then so on and so forth. The problem with the version that college basketball dropped on Saturday is literally while Ohio State was being announced as the number one seed, they were in action on another channel against Indiana. 
and God forbid they lose that game, then all of the brackets that uh, you just released, if you're the selection committee, all of those are irrelevant. So I just think they should have made the scheduling a little bit better. Overall, though, I do agree with the top four seeds of Gonzaga at one, Baylor at two, Michigan at three, Ohio State at four. And it was really also the first time where it hit me like, wow, we're actually going to have an NCAA tournament coming up this season with no Duke, with no Kentucky, with no Michigan State, maybe with no North Carolina. So the tournament uh, without any blue bloods, it's going to be pretty crazy. And it's the first time that it hit me like, wow, we're going to be here during the NCAA tournament on that first Thursday or Friday night. It's going to be the primetime slot. And Duke nor Kentucky, the teams that usually play there, are nowhere to be found. That's crazy to me. And it really just hit me for the first time. Like, wow, the bracket reveal, no Duke, no Kentucky. Takeaway number four. There are very few fan bases in college basketball snake bitten more than the Georgia Tech Yellow Jacket fans. And for those of you who don't believe me, just watch that game Friday night that Georgia Tech lost in heartbreaking, heartbreaking fashion to Brett Brownell and the Clemson Tigers. If you missed it, Georgia Tech was winning basically the whole game. It was close the whole way. And Jose Alvarado, their senior guard, was at the free throw line with Georgia Tech down one. If he makes both, he puts his team up by three. He instead misses both. Nick Honor goes all the way down the floor for Clemson, pulls up from three, and banked it in. One of the crazier shots we've seen in college basketball throughout this season. And he deserves a lot of credit for that. But man, Georgia Tech, it's crazy because Georgia Tech is not as far from the NCAA tournament as you would think they are. Georgia Tech has some pretty good wins on their resume uh, this season, including one over Clemson in Atlanta a couple weeks ago. So if Georgia Tech could have won this game, they have two wins over Clemson. They were competitive uh, with Virginia a couple week, uh, days ago, I believe. And yeah, Georgia Tech could play. They are capable of making any game competitive. The problem is, really, since Josh Pastner has been there and since I've started watching college basketball the last 15 years, Georgia Tech has been irrelevant, and they have shown some signs this season of improving a little bit. Moses Wright is a really good player, Alvarado, but my issue is, DeVoe, if Josh Pastner isn't going to be able to win with these players, then what players is he going to be able to win with? That would be my only concern. When it comes to Josh Pastner and Georgia Tech, but just a heartbreaking loss. Luckily, they were able to counter with a win on Sunday against Pittsburgh. But Georgia Tech, they could be in the tournament. They've just let so many games get away. Takeaway number five. Drake and Loyola Chicago are both NCAA tournament teams, in my opinion. However, ultimately, the question is going to be, whoever doesn't win the conference tournament, are they going to be able to get in? And I do think if you're the Missouri Valley and when you're watching that game Saturday and Sunday, you're going to be saying to yourself, okay, our number one goal, our number one priority is to get two teams from the Missouri Valley into this NCAA tournament. And if I and I think if you are a fan of the Missouri Valley or a fan of Drake, Loyola Chicago, this was the best case scenario if you wanted that two bid Missouri Valley because now I think there's a good chance Drake wins the tournament. Loyola is going to get in as an at large. Their resume is pretty solid. And after, you know, after, after how long could you keep Drake out of the tournament? I've been doing the bracketology for my uh, Twitter page and uh, I post it every Thursday. It is very hard to find 68 teams that are good enough and deserve to be in the NCAA tournament. I'm not saying Drake could necessarily make a deep run to the final four or anything but they are without a doubt one of the 68 best teams in college basketball i understand their resume doesn't necessarily show that they have any great wins but i watched that basketball game against loyal chicago that was just a competitive competitive basketball game and drake they deserve a lot of credit because if loyal chicago would have swept drake on the road, back-to-back -back games, then who knows what we're talking about when it comes to Drake this morning. But hey, Roman Penn and the boys were able to get the job done, and Drake is looking like a team that I'm 
pretty sure a lot of people will be picking to pull a magical upset or two just because they are very well coached, they're young, they're fun to watch, and they can play. And Loyola Chicago is a good basketball team, too. So those two teams in the Missouri Valley, I think both could be set up to earn a potential at-large bid to the NCAA tournament if needed. It's just at the same time, they're just going to need to play their best. They're going to need to execute at all costs. And I have a feeling that Drake Loyola Chicago Part 3 may be in the works sooner rather than later in the MVC tournament. Takeaway number six. I teased it earlier, but I just wanted to give a quick shout out to my guy, Lon Kruger and the Oklahoma Sooners, because when it comes to the contenders of the Big 12, right, I totally understand that we're going to look at Lon Kruger and all the great work he's done at Oklahoma, and we're going to consider them to be pretty good. But you have Baylor, you have West Virginia, you have Texas Tech, you have Kansas, you have all these powerhouse programs, which is what makes the Big 12's depth so good. The only issue, though, is that Oklahoma deserves to be in that conversation as well. And I don't think Oklahoma is as easy to put in some of these categories compared to some of those other Big 12 teams. But at the same time, what I will say is this. When I look at these Oklahoma Sooners, they are capable of beating anyone. They beat an Alabama when the Tide were playing really their best basketball of the season and no one else could beat them. Same thing could be said about West Virginia, by the way. I was getting ready to do a whole segment on the Mountaineers before this show today, and then Oklahoma just decides to come into their building and ruin it. And they decided to come into their building and make a statement. And Lon Kruger and his staff deserve a lot of credit for that. They will do whatever they can to put their players in the best position to win as possible and to be honest that's what makes Juan Kruger a successful coach he could do whatever he can to get the job done at all times and he is the only coach in the history of college basketball to lead five separate teams to the NCAA tournament I'm not sure about you guys but not many other coaches in college basketball have been able to do that and Juan Kruger and the seniors deserve a lot of credit. Davion Harmon, I love his game. Brady Manick, Austin Reeves, coming back from COVID, looked healthy. He was making clutch shot after clutch shot after clutch shot for Oklahoma in that game. He deserves a lot of credit for coming back. He looks healthy, and the Sooners are a team I'll be keeping my eye on. Takeaway number seven. I wanted to give a congratulations to the UConn Huskies because you're going to look at this box score, and you're just going to see, oh, UConn went into Xavier on Saturday and won. Why is that such a big deal? Well, I'll tell you why that is such a big deal. And a lot of it just has to do with the facts straight up. UConn's best player, a kid by the name of James Booknight, who I believe is going to be a first-round pick. He's a stud, one of the best players in college basketball. He actually went down with an injury and has been out for a couple weeks now. And I actually watched UConn up close and personal against Providence. I believe it was Wednesday afternoon game. And they just looked lost offensively. They were really struggling to score, really struggling to create. And UConn, when I was watching that game, just looked like a team to me where they were just treading as much water as they possibly could until their star James Booknight comes back and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that but for the first time in a while on Saturday against Xavier UConn just looked each other uh, at each other in the eye and said we are gonna have to do whatever we can to win this game and get the job done because as much as it pains us to say it who knows what the deal with James Booknight is? When James Booknight comes back, are we even going to be a thousand percent sure that he's going to be able to be that same player? I'm not a hundred percent sure. He may be a little rusty, as great as he is. And UConn realized, look, if we want to make the NCAA tournament, we have a perfect opportunity here. Playing on the road against not a great team, but a team in Xavier that is going to make the tournament. And UConn really took them to the woodshed. The game was never particularly close. And... UConn deserves a lot of credit for that. Isaiah Whaley was very good for the Huskies. Akuka Cook was back in the lineup. Uh, RJ Cole was making shot after shot after shot. And that's important for UConn because that is really where they've been struggling, that uh, ability to create and that ability to score. So I wanted to give a shout out to the uh, Huskies. They've been playing some uh, okay basketballs of late. They needed that victory over Xavier. Takeaway number eight. 
The Oregon Ducks are another team that I will be keeping my eye out on. And if you've listened to this show, you will know that going into this season, I wasn't someone who was particularly high on the Oregon Ducks. I was someone who had the belief that the Ducks over the last couple years, as great of a coach as Dana Altman is, I think they've brought in like a little too much talent. And last year especially, they didn't really have the proper rotations and Dana Altman didn't really know what to do with all these big boy bodies that they had on that team. They never really knew what they were doing. They never really looked in sync. They never really looked like they were going to be able to develop chemistry. But let me tell you this, man. This year's Oregon Ducks team may be different because the transfers they've brought in, Eugene Omarui from Rutgers and LJ Figueroa from St. John's, they're both playing some really good basketball right now. And you know who else is playing some really good basketball right now? Chris Duarte. He is one of the more underrated players in all of college basketball and could be the Pac-12 player of the year when it's all said and done. Probably Evan Mobley has that award wrapped up for the most part, but Duarte is very good and they're getting healthy. They're getting Will Richardson back as well. I'm telling you, keep an eye out on the Oregon Ducks. Their team squarely on the bubble right now. Uh, we'll see how they do when it comes to the NCAA tournament, if they get in or not. But Dan Allman's a really good basketball coach. I trust him. Oregon is going to be a tournament team. Takeaway number nine. A team that definitely is not going to be an NCAA tournament team and a team that high key has been one of the more bigger disappointments for me in all of college basketball this season has been Kevin Keats and his NC State Wolfpack. And I am someone who has been on the Kevin Keats bandwagon. When he first came to rally North Carolina from UNC Wilmington, there were a lot of Wolfpack fans who didn't necessarily love the hire. They were just very eh about it. And I said, look, your NC State, I get it. You may want to do a little bit better than bringing in the coach from UNC Wilmington, but trust me, I said it. This guy's going to be able to get the job done. I said this guy would be able to rebrand the culture and players will want to play for him. And unfortunately, it doesn't look like that right now. NC State was non-competitive at home against the Duke team that we all know isn't very good. And I understand that it's heartbreaking for NC State to lose Devin Daniels. He was their best scorer, their best natural creator. And it's unfortunate what happened to him, but man, this NC State team right now is just not very good. When you look at the way Cam Hayes, freshman at point guard, Braxton Beverly is just not very good. Uh, I like Funderburk, I like Manny Bates, but these guys just aren't doing enough right now. They need a little bit of a spark, and if I'm Kevin Keats, I just need to make sure my guys come out more competitive next game. Or else, if I'm an NC State fan, that's when I'm really getting frustrated. And takeaway number 10 wanted to talk about the Mountain West a little bit, and I spoke a little bit about the Missouri Valley in one of the previous bullet points and how it's looking pretty good, I think, for Drake and Loyola Chicago to both possibly get in to the NCAA tournament. And the thing about the Mountain West is they have four teams on the bubble as well, and none of them have really been able to separate from each other. I think if you ask me, Zach, how many teams from the Mountain West are getting in to the NCAA tournament come March? My first guess would be probably three. I think Boise finds a way in. I think San Diego State finds a way in. But that last spot is tricky between Colorado State and Utah State. And Utah State has a huge huge weekend week excuse me coming up this week as they will go to Boise twice if Utah State wants to feel safe as an at-large contender by not winning their conference tournament this is a series that they're gonna have to take if Utah State could win two games from Boise if I'm an Aggie fan I'm feeling pretty good about my team's chances to make the tournament. And I like Utah State. Namiya Shkata could play. Craig Smith is a great coach. But this is going to be a tough, tough ass to go into Boise, Idaho and win. However, what I'll also say is this. As good as Boise State is, their last four or five games have been nothing impressive. Losing to Nevada twice, and I watched both of those games. Towards the back end, they really just didn't know what they were doing. My guy, uh, Grant Sherfield, just hitting a crazy shot at the end to win it. And I think that... Boise is vulnerable. I still believe the best team in the Mountain West is San Diego State, who Utah State beat twice, by the way. So it's really a whole big mess. We'll see what ends up happening. But the Mountain West, Boise and Utah State, that is a matchup to keep your eyes on this weekend, or this week, excuse me. And when you look at the Mountain West, you have Boise, you have Utah. I watched some of those teams in action this weekend. They are really, really good.